This is Sign Language with Bruce Williams and Doc Goldstein. Hi, and welcome to episode 166 of Sign Language. This is Bruce Williams from SignLanguagePodcast.com. Joining me on the other end, it's Doc. How are you, mate? Hey, this is, I'm good. How are you? I'm How's great. everybody? Yeah, we're good. We're good. What have you been up to in the last couple of weeks? Well, today we went for a bike ride. You know, I have a road bike, yep. uh, a Trek road bike that I'm stupid enough to get on a couple of times a week. And today was no exception. So we rode from, uh, well, I'm in Orange County, California. So I rode from somewhere inland that nobody would care about to Huntington Beach, which which they may know about. Right. And then back, back again. And it was only 25 miles, but I feel like I'm dying. <laughs> Well, good for you to be getting out there, mate. I, I used to do a lot of bike riding, but since I bought a motorbike, I've hardly touched my push bike. So, yeah. Good. I can re- I can relate. Yeah. Good on you for doing that. That's great. <laughs> so, the topic for this one, you know, uh, specifications have been bugging me for a while. So, I thought, you know, I'd get unbugged by releasing it into the universe, you know. <laughs> Excellent. My, my buggedness. <laughs> Because a, a lot of audio people or people who want to be engineers or just people who care uh, sometimes wonder what all these specifications mean. And more importantly, they think that if two things have the same specification, that they might actually sound the same. And that's not the case. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> you know, and I think that there just may be things that we don't know how to measure that have to create that create that situation. So Right. So I've got some specs that I sent you, yep. and I've got one of them up in front of me right now. So I thought I'd just go through it and uh, maybe talk about the good and the bad and the ugly of uh, sure. specifications. So so which one are you looking at? So right now I have the spec sheet up in tr- front of me for the Sennheiser MD421. Okay, yep. Now, this is a mic I use a lot, and I think this is a great microphone. Yeah. And they make a lot, Sennheiser makes a lot of great microphones, not only their own, but also under the Neumann brand because they own Neumann. And, um, right. So nobody should think that I have this up because um, I don't like this mic because it's not the case. So, but going through it. So let's let's just set the stage for those who are unfamiliar. Uh, the MD421 is a large dynamic microphone. Uh, and has been used for vocal applications. I've personally used this on toms on drum kits and found it to be a great tom mic. Uh, how have you used this mic in the past, Doc? Well, lately I've been using it on toms, but also on brass. Okay. And uh, I used it on woodwinds not too long ago, and the results were a little mixed maybe, but it could have been the acoustics of the room more than the microphone. Right. But it's a really great mic. It has this weird way of connecting to the mic stand adapter that I don't love. It can easily like come off if you touch it the wrong way. Right. But uh, other than that, um, and it has a, a good high pass filter on it, okay. um, which is great. It's called M at one end and speech at the other, uh, or S for speech and M for music. And it's uh, it works really well. One thing about this microphone though, um, even with the switch all the way to M, which means no high pass filter, it still has a little bit of roll off in the low end. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. Okay. Now, I, I also have used this on Tom Toms many times, and I like it a lot for that. Yep. I, re- I really do. And uh, I have some friends who, who feel differently, but, you know, that's the fun about being an engineer. You, you don't even have to agree with your friends. So uh, <laughs> now somebody told me that. They use this mic for the Super Tramp records uh, for Tom's. Okay. And I don't know. I don't know if that's correct. Uh, it may be. It may not be. I wasn't there. But you know, uh, it wouldn't surprise me because I've had really good luck using this on Tom's. And maybe that that roll end, that roll off in the low end, is the reason why. So if I'm looking at right now at the um, at the specs and it's showing a graph of frequency response, and it shows that at 100 hertz, it's flat. But then you get down to, let's see, 90, 80, around 80 hertz, it starts to roll off. And by the time you get down to 40 hertz, it's definitely down, uh, looks like. Almost 10 dB. Two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah, it's down quite a bit. Now, that doesn't bother me. I mean, usually there's nothing down below 100 hertz but trouble. Yep. (laughs) Which I've said before. Yeah. And uh, I don't need to get 100 hertz on a Tom mic, although 
unless I'm doing a really low frequency tom mic. Yeah. This mic also shows a boost in the mid range around 5K or so. Yep. And then when it gets to be about just a little above 10K, it just, well, more like 15. It just dumps. Yep. It just rolls right off. Yep. So here's a mic that's already bandpass filtered in a sense. You know, it's got the ultra highs are gone, the ultra lows are rolled off. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet it sounds really good. Now, I'm going to talk about polar pattern in a minute. Before I do that, though, if you just read on here where it says technical data, it get, tells you that the pickup pattern is cardioid, yes, yep. which is, you know, heart-shaped or unidirectional. Yep. Here's where it bugs me. The frequency response, it says it's 30 to 17,000 hertz. Yeah. Okay, that's fine because we have the graph down below that shows the frequency response. But I've seen, I've seen files from Sennheiser in the past where it doesn't include that... Uh, doesn't, that, doesn't include the graph. That graph. Yeah. Right. So if, if you have a microphone that's 30 to 17K, unless you know how far it, it is, plus or minus, during that range, it's not a useful specification. You have to know yeah. that at thir somewhere between 30 and 17K, that it's flat within plus or minus what? Yes. Half dB, you know, 1 dB, yep. you know, 80 dB. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's just not enough to know that the mic goes from, you know, DC to blue light or 30 to 17K. <laughs> it's, 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 it's got to, you have to know how far boost or minus that it might be in that range. You know, so. as, as much as I agree, and I, and I think, you know, the, the, it'd be nice if all microphone manufacturers would spec the frequency response of a mic to plus or minus 3 dB. So you at least knew at what point it was 3 dB down at the low end and at what point it was 3 dB, 3 dB down at the top end. I think where it gets troublesome is that when you have these presence peaks built into the response of the mic, you know, in the in the upper mid range, they can quite often be more than 3 dB off the, you know, the baseline, if you like. Like so, this one. Yeah. yeah. So how, how, how should they spec this kind of thing, you know, or, or, or should it just be mandatory that they include a frequency response graph as well? I think it should be mandatory, but I don't think there's any rule book about it. No. You know, but I've seen things out there that don't include that, and I think that's a problem. But this spec sheet does, yeah. and it also includes a polar pattern versus frequency, which is really great because most people don't think about the fact that if you have a cardioid pattern at 1K, 1,000 hertz, yep. by the time you get up to 16,000 hertz, it might be severely degraded, even in a high-quality microphone. Right. So here you can see that at different frequencies, you get different roll-offs or different shape to the pattern. It gets a lot tighter and narrower as you go higher up. And by the time you get to 16K, you know, it's not that great. But I don't know of a mic that is. Yeah. And there's one third thing I'd like to say, so I might as well just say everything I know in the first 30 <laughs> seconds of the show. Uh, <laughs> it's a short show. Um so I've had a lot of people who, who are students who want to buy one good microphone for their home studio and then record all their tracks on either that or on their direct box if they're a keyboard player or what have you. Right. And uh, I think we've talked about that briefly before on the earlier version of this show. And I would just like to once again say that that's really not a great idea because whatever the frequent response of that mic is, you're going to imprint that on everything you record in your sessions if you just use one mic. Yeah. So I would recommend that you're better off with two or three mics that maybe are not so expensive but are different from each other than doing that and having one frequency response graph and one mic sound as as it were all over every one of your tracks so yeah that's a, an, an interesting point i can i can imagine that for a lot of home recordists who you know, may not play in a band they might just you know record their own music for their own enjoyment uh and who maybe don't want to make a, a career out of it, then the idea of spending money on multiple microphones might present a little bit of a, a challenge. And if that was the case, if you did have to stick to one microphone, I guess I'd be looking at the frequency response charts of the various microphones that you, you know, let's say you've created a short list of half a dozen mics. I'd probably be looking for the mic with the flattest response something that was sure. going to color the sound the least so that, you know, as, as, as you put it, Doc, so that you're not imprinting, you know, this sonic footprint of a, 
you know, a mic with a radical frequency response onto every single track that you record. I'd be looking for something that was as, you know, uniform across the frequency range as I could find. Well, yeah, if every mic has a big boost at 5K, <laughs> yeah. after a while, all your, all your mixes are going to sound like you're slicing somebody's head off. Exactly. You know, I hate when that happens. And if that's, you know, and if that is the case where you've got a mic that has, you know, quite a pronounced presence peak, then I guess you really got to be very analytical about the frequency response of each individual track as you're mixing it. And, you know, maybe you need to put in a couple of, you know, little dips in that upper mid range at different frequencies across different tracks just to try and, you know, break up the presence of that, you know, that presence peak from that one microphone if you are doing everything with one mic. Wow, that's radical. You're actually talking about putting EQ down on the way into the recording. <laughs> wow. Well, you could do wow. it. You could do it during the recording or you could do it at mix down. It doesn't really matter. Oh, it takes real grown-ups to do it during the recording. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I'm just saying that, you know, if, if you've got, you know, l like just using the MD421 uh, as a, just as a, an example, we're not picking on this microphone by any stretch of the imagination, but when you no, look- No, I at, love this mic. Yeah, but when you look at that frequency response graph, you can see that, you know, that mid-range boost starts to happen uh, probably around- around the, uh, just above 2k it starts to ramp up and it peaks right around four and a half 5k and then it starts to drop off again towards 8k so what i'm saying is that you know if you're recording three four five different signals uh for a song that are all going to use that one microphone then yeah, you know, maybe across each of those tracks, you just put in a little bit of a dip somewhere in that range, but at a different frequent, like a different center frequency for each of the tracks, so that you're not you're not taking out the same part of the frequency range on every track, but just trying to soften that presence peak collectively across all of the tracks. Does that make sense? It does. It does. You know, if you for those who are really OCD, maybe you could use the mic to record some acoustic pink noise, and then look at that on a real time analyzer so you know where to set the EQ to get a flat response out of it. But it's it's probably better just to make sure that whatever you're recording sounds good to you at the time. So definitely following up on this mic, I just want to uh, uh, before I open up a different spec sheet, yep. I just wanted to say that this is a wonderful microphone. It's rugged. Yeah. You know, you you can't kill this thing. Uh, it sounds great. And it's useful for a lot of stuff where you don't always want a condenser. Like if you're trying to cut back on leakage or something like that, it's great for that. Yep. Um, so I use this mic all the time and have done for years. Yep. So. Uh, and I think one of the things that makes this a great Tom mic is the fact that it's a side address microphone. It's not an end address, which a lot of dynamics can be. Um, and and that means that you can bring it in sideways over. Wait, the wait, 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 wait. Stop. Stop the podcast. Oh, okay. Stop the Yep. This is not a side address mic. Really? Really. Oh, okay. <laughs> Edit. I've been okay. No, I'm I'm happy to leave this in. I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um I, I guess I was fooled by the The band of metal right across the front of the mic. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I, I assumed yeah. that that meant that yeah, you, you, you would address this from the sides where the grill is open. Right. So, but which, but in a case like that, which side? Because it doesn't really say that, right? True. Um, and it's not a figure of eight, mic. No, it's not a ribbon. No, 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 no. Okay, so it's end so, address. Yeah, it is. Wow. It's end address. Or I've been doing it wrong for, <laughs> you know. Like I said before, since the Donner Party started out, I've been doing it wrong. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Okay. I stand okay, I'm going to close this, but I, I do like this mic. Yeah, I don't yeah. want anybody, uh, to, and I'm not just saying that because there's a lawyer looking down at me right now. <laughs> from you know, I'm going to open up a, another spec sheet. It's from Automated Processes, Inc., or API, yeah. which they're at apiaudio.com. Sure. And anybody who's been a professional recording engineer or a professional audio guy knows about API. They've been around since you know, the late 60s, early 60s, whatever. Yep. Uh, company started by, I think, Saul Walker, who I knew, and uh, 
who passed recently, just a fantastic person, yeah, right. uh, great engineer. And uh, this is an equalizer. And it does show uh, in this spec sheet, which I downloaded from the API website at apiaudio.com. I did download this, and it shows uh, this is the 550B, yep. not the 550A, which is three bands. Yes. So, so back in the day, the original 550 a or 550 equalizer was a three band equalizer. Then later on in the life of this little guy, they decided to add a band to it, and that became the 550B. Yep. There was an earlier version of a 550B that had different electronics, and it's not around now, and we don't care. So we're just talking about what they offer now. <laughs> yep. Interestingly, I'm just I'm just going to jump in here. Yeah. I've got in my rack. The 5500, which is essentially oh. two 550Bs side by side. So it's a stereo version. Oh, I'm jealous of you now. That's <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh, I that love it. That is nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And doesn't that have a little switch that affects how much the little boost and cut? Because they're, they're listed as being 2DB for boost and cut on each step. But doesn't that one have a little toggle switch it's, on it? It's not a toggle lowers switch. That? It's not a toggle switch. It's actually a three position rotary knob. So it goes by one by a half and by a quarter. Oh. So nice. so yeah, the, the the thing is you've got one of those rotary knobs for each side, so for the left channel and for the right channel. But whatever you set it to, it affects all four bands. So you can't set it individually for the four bands, so you you're either running all four channels at their nominal value or at half their nominal value or at a quarter of their nominal value. Well, that's a really nice switch to have and really would make this suitable for mastering yes. where you need, instead of a constant rotary switch where you can't repeat it a second time, it, it's nice to have a rotary and have it snap to a certain uh, value. Exactly. And know, that, and know that you can always get back to it. And I would guess that API has made sure that both sides match really closely so that it's meaningful to do that. Yeah. You know? yeah. They're they're very good at quality control back there. Yeah. So yeah. they're made in in the, they're made it back on the East Coast, like near Washington DC, I believe they are actually. Right. And, and you know, they're they're a really good company and they really do care about quality back there. I don't want to sound like I'm an ad for them. <laughs> but if I as I look up though, you know, I'll just remind everybody that I'm brought to you today by a Neumann U87 plugged into an <laughs> API mic preamp. Nice, right? nice. And from there into Pro Tools, which um, might not be Bruce's favorite workstation, but it certainly <laughs> is mine, which is a whole other podcast we'll do someday. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I could just hear you. I could hear you laughing at the other end. Look, so, uh, look, I'm getting I'm getting more comfortable with it every day. Like I've been on it now for probably a month, uh, and the the funny thing is, I keep discovering keyboard shortcuts by accident. Like I'll bump a key accidentally and go, "Oh wow, that just did X." <laughs> you know, so um, well, the, the one that I discovered uh, by mistake when I started out on it was the N key. The yep. N key will drive you crazy. And just to repeat for anybody out there who likes Pro Tools or is using Pro Tools, I tend to slam the space bar will start and stop wherever you are in a session, right? From your yep. cursor yep. or from where you played last. Well, right next to the space bar is this N key. And I kept, when I started out, again, this was back when my hair was brown and my teeth were white, so it's a <laughs> while ago. When I started out, I would hit the space bar and not notice that I was just barely tapping the N key. Well, that sets up a situation where no matter where your cursor is, it'll only play back from where it last stopped, right. no matter what you do to the cursor. Yeah. And it's also in preferences. And so I would be pulling my hair out. What is wrong with this thing? You know, what am I doing? And finally, I figured out that it's the end key. So there's just a <laughs> word of the wise. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll do a whole podcast about this another time, but yeah. Yes. So, so, back so I'm on this... Yeah, specification. Yeah. So back to, back to the subject at hand. Not that you know I tend to wander. <laughs> so this is the four band. It's called the five fifty B discrete four band EQ. Yep. Now, if you go, if you scroll down, uh, and it shows the frequency response curve, you can see here that the more booster cut you put on something, the tighter the bandwidth becomes, or the smaller the bandwidth becomes of the equalizer. Yeah. Which is called Q. That's right. Now, Q is not 
you know, a person who rides around on the Enterprise and makes Jean-Luc Picard mad. Q is a mathematical factor that is essentially frequency divided by bandwidth. That's how you figure out what the number of the Q is. And a higher Q means that you've got a tighter or smaller bandwidth, so it's peakier, which is great for notching out stuff if, you wanna, if you've got something you just want to notch out. And that when you only give it a little bit of EQ, maybe a couple dB, maybe 4 dB, well, then the Q is a lower number and the bandwidth of this thing is wider. Yeah. Well, that's very musical. You know, a wide EQ is a really musical tone control. Yep. So even when you have this equalizer really cranked, either up or down, it still never gets to what I would call a notch filter. It just isn't designed to do that. No. So this thing is always like a massively cool tone control to me. You have a lot of selections, uh, both in the four band, in the four band and three band version. You have a lot of good frequency selections, and it sounds great. It's all discrete electronics and transformers that we talked about in past shows. Got a lot of headroom. Uh, so this is this is definitely one of my desert island equalizers for sure. Yeah, but. I just wanted to mention the fact that it's really important that they do include this frequency response graph because you can really see how the more it's cranked, the narrower the Q becomes. And, you know, maybe you, it won't work as a notch filter, but still, nevertheless, if you have something that's really resonant and it's not just, you know, one or two frequencies wide, you could get to it with this equalizer. But it also explains why some people would, uh, instead of using a 550 or a 550A or B, might use something that can notch and then follow that by one of these equalizers in order to warm up, I hate that word, but warm up the signal and get it to sound musical again. Yep. So it shows the filter slope as being 12 dB per octave, which is great. It's very musical to do that. The input impedance is a fairly high impedance, you know, almost 19K. Uh, the output impedance is less than 75 ohms, so it's meant to be bridging. Maybe we should talk about bridging someday, but sure. those can, those of you can Google it if you want to know what it means to have a bridging input. And then uh, it gives you nominal levels and all these things. I don't have any complaints with this thing. I just want to point out that it says clipping level is at plus 30 dBU. And the reason why it's such a good high clipping level is they must be getting some gain out of the output transformer on this thing. Right. Because, you know, you don't get that high with just plus and minus 15 volts, and this is a single-ended deal here. At least the original circuit was. So, What do you mean by single-ended So Well, power supply-wise. Power supply-wise. This thing acts like it's a single-ended supply at 28 volts. Right. Although although it runs in a, runs in a, in a lunchbox, which is not single-ended. It's, it's bipolar. Right. Which doesn't mean that... It doesn't mean that the equalizer gets in a bad mood every couple of weeks. It means that... <laughs> It means that uh, it's running plus and minus 15 volts. But back in the old day, they used to run a lot of stuff, and Rupert Neve did this. He ran a lot of his stuff, single-ended power supplies, and then somehow the industry switched over to a bipolar design. And I'm just guessing, but I bet that had something to do with the uh, influx of op-amp designs. Right. But in any event, this is a this is not single-ended, or if it is, you know, I, knew, I actually have to look at the circuitry of this. It could be that it's a single-ended internally designed to work in a bipolar power supply environment. Right. Uh, you know, I, sh- I probably, you know, I, I feel silly that I don't already know the answer to that. Uh, I'm sure I have a lot of friends who do. But I can tell you this thing. When you plug this thing in, it sounds great, as you can attest to since you have that dual-channel version of it. Yeah. Well, I'm, this is one of my favorite EQs of all time yeah, right here. I, every podcast I do, I'm recording through that EQ. Oh, what, do you, what, what, what are you boosting or cutting? Uh, okay, so I'm going to drift off the mic a little as I uh, just lean over to look at it. <laughs> uh, so I'm up two at 100 hertz, down two at 300, uh, up, up two at 5K, and up four... I think it's 12K, up for at 12K. So you're making a little bit brighter and dialing out the mud with that with that dip at 300 hertz. Yeah. You know, yeah. 300 hertz is right in the middle of the mud <laughs> Yeah, that's, range. that's exactly right. <laughs> you know, and, and just as a, a aside from that, uh, if you're trying to EQ something and you've got some, and it's muddy, sometimes just dropping, putting a dip in there somewhere between 200 and 400 
can all of a sudden sound like you added bottom and top and yeah. all of a sudden get your get your clarity working really well without actually having to do that. Yep. And if you don't have to boost, well, that's better for your headroom, which is a whole other subject we're not talking about today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I quite often, particularly with acoustic guitars, I will quite often put in a little bit of a dip around three to 400 hertz. You know, some of them quite sound a little bit boxy in that region. And as you say, just a couple of dB out in that region can really clean them up no end yeah oh yeah so let's see what should i open up next well the next one i have here is bach audio b-o-c-k yeah and that's david bach's company he's up in burbank and he makes similar to um the aea company that made your ribbon mic yeah bach audio makes uh doesn't make ribbons he makes condenser mics and these are extremely high quality microphones right I mean, extremely high quality. Well, he makes one called the, uh, it's a, off the user manual, it's called the Model 4-0-7. So it's a 47, it's a U47 type microphone. Oh, okay, yep. Uh, except it's cardioid all the time. Right. This thing, I don't care what the spec says, and I have, I'm going to look at it in a second, but this thing sounds absolutely wonderful. Right. It says its own preparatory proprietary cable and power supply uh, audio output is standard three pin xlr blah 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 P- classic pen toad as single triode circuitry with no additional negative feedback and high quality okay blah blah so those of those of you out there who are really uh audiophiles yeah you probably like to hear the fact that there's not much negative feedback happening because there are those who feel that negative feedback uh, degrades the sound quality. I'm not so sure, but people who I trust say it does. And so if they say so, it must be true. Uh, so what, and, what uh, exactly do you mean by negative feedback? Well, negative feedback is where you take some of the output of the of an amplifier or of a piece of equipment and run it back to the input again. And it helps clear out nonlinearity. So if you have... Well, you flip it out of phase when you run it. That's why it's called negative feedback. Right. So let's suppose you have you have an amplifier, and there's a little bit of nonlinear stuff coming out of the output that's not good because we're looking for linear, mm-hmm. meaning you know what goes in goes out without any changes. Well, nonlinear means there's changes. So what you do is you take a little bit of that output signal, and you flip the phase on it and run it back to the input again. And because it's out of phase, it tends to cancel that nonlinear issue. Right. Yep. But there are those who say that uh, too much negative feedback uh, doesn't sound good right. to the human ear. Uh, so people tend to use just as much, just only how much they need. Like a lot of Fender amps, for example, have negative feedback as well. Okay. And where the Vox AC30, which is a very famous amplifier from Liverpool, you know, back in the day, <laughs> yep. those don't, which makes the amp break up quicker. So. Right. So negative feedback is just taking some of the output, flipping it over, and running it back into the input again to get rid of bad stuff, Okay. technically speaking. And you're saying yeah. that the 407's power supply doesn't do this? It says here, no additional negative feedback. Yep, right. I don't know what that means, additional negative feedback. That, that sounds to me like there is some. Right. I'd have to ask David more, but, you know, I, I just... These are fantastic microphones. I don't know if they have these over there uh, in your part of the world. I'd, I'd have to look around to see if there's a, a a retailer who is you know selling them here in in Sydney. There, there's probably somebody carrying them. Uh, we've got a couple of good you know music oriented you know, recording shops around, so there's probably somebody who's representing them. But I, I wouldn't imagine they'd shift them in huge quantities. Well, this is a fairly expensive mic, and um, but if you're serious about building a studio, and uh, you should have one, right. at least one of these mics. And he makes other models too that are just that are all good. It's probably a heck of a lot cheaper than buying a U47. Yes, and, and you know <laughs> that takes me on the subject of old equipment. So I went to a studio uh, a couple of years ago that I won't name what it was called, but it, uh, some really big records came out of the studio. Right, and I and I walked around in there, and the owner really nice guy was showing me around and this studio had two SSLs in it and an old Neve console. It was just beautiful. So I asked him, I go, which, what do you use for what? 
And he goes, well, you know, I don't use the Neve that often because it's, it's, it's great that it's an old Neve and all that, but, you know, there's constantly stuff going wrong with it because it's old. The switches yep. go bad and, and the electronics go bad and what have you. So um, he may not even, I haven't been there in a while. He may not have it now. I don't really know if he does or not. And on the SSLs, he's working in Pro Tools so much that all he's using the SSLs for really is mic preamps and summing, <laughs> yeah. you know, and he did that, this huge record that everybody would know what it was if I mentioned it. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you offline just to frustrate the listeners. Sure. But um, <laughs> anything I can do to frustrate the listeners, I'm all about it. <laughs> so <laughs> let's go on to the next. So, uh, so, he, so he was actually using the SSL as a summing rig? Yeah, he was using it as a summing rig nice. for his mic pre's. Nice. And maybe a little EQ here and there, but mainly he was doing most of the work in the box, as they say. Yeah, yeah. Which is really great because, you know, if you mix, if you're mixing in an analog world, and you hand this thing over to a record company, and they come back to you in a couple of weeks and say, you know, it's perfect, but we'd like a version with the vocal a half a dB up, yeah, and then you got to put together all your analog stuff and make it sound just like it sounded before, and that can be iffy with analog because totally. especially if you have knobs, if you have knobs that are constantly variable knobs on stuff, yep, and a grease pencil is about as accurate as you can get. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just not, you know, it's not really good for that sort of thing. Whereas plugins, you know, in, in a workstation always come back exactly like you have them. And here's something to think about. If you're making music, nobody's going to listen to your mix and go, oh, I don't like the way this sounds because I can tell I used a plugin for the vocal compressor instead of hardware. Nobody knows. No. Nah. No, no way. Nobody knows that. No. Only you know that, right? Yep. And a couple of months later, even you won't remember unless you wrote it down. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. So, obviously, I'm wandering once again off top. So, was there anything in particular in the spec sheet for the 407 that particularly bothered you? Nothing that bothers me, but it is very complete. Like distortion versus sound pressure level or SPL at 1K. Yep. You even see specifies that it's at 1K, so he's ahead of the curve. Yeah. 112 dB about at about 0.5% THD, which stands for total harmonic distortion. Yep. 118 dB at 1%, so you can see it going up. And then 129 dB is 2% THD. Yeah which this is a tube microphone, so some would say it's beginning to sound warm. To me, that whole warmth thing is worth a podcast because I don't always buy it. Yeah. I know a lot of a lot of companies sell stuff that's got tubes in it, and they always you know, talk about how warm it is, but it's the design has as much to do with it as whatever part you're using, and I know I've said that before. Right. The impedance of this thing, the output impedance is 200 ohms, which is right where it should be. It's transform balanced. Uh, which you know some microphones are and some microphones aren't. Yeah. Recommended load 2K, so that's 10 times the uh, output impedance, which is a good thing. Yeah. The tube is a new old stock tube. Uh, a new old stock tube means that it's an old tube that he was able to find that hasn't been used, so yeah. it's new old stock. Yeah. So it's been sitting on a shelf for you know 30 or 40 years unused. Yeah. So it's it's new in that sense that it has not been used before, but it was made quite a long time ago. Sure. Yeah. Knowing Dave, he probably looked at a zillion tubes before he picked one <laughs> yeah. you know, for, for the microphone because he's so quality uh, oriented. Yeah. Uh, not you know. Let's let's move on to another one. Yeah, but, for sure. So the the ubiquitous AKG four fourteen. Yeah. Which one? The XL two or the XLS? <laughs> Well, you just made my point. Right. Because there's, what, 10 versions of this microphone out there? <laughs> yeah. And they all look about the same, but they don't sound the same? Right. I've got two spec sheets here, uh, an XL2 and an XLS. Right. Uh, so I'm going to open up the C414 XL2. Yep. Now, this is a newer version of the microphone. As soon as you scroll down to page two, it shows a photograph of the microphone. It's got a gold screen, yep, and that's the front of the mic, and then the, the back of the mic is black. And uh, it shows an LED, green LED, that is, in fact, the switch position. Now, older versions of this microphone just had a hard switch, and you looked at the position of the switch to know how the mic was set up. But on this newer version, 
uh, it has to see phantom power before the before it wakes up and gives you this LED so that you can see uh, what polar pattern and what high pass filter or pad setting you may have. Yeah, this is one of my favorite mics these days for piano, also for uh, woodwinds where I don't want a lot of shrill high end. Although this thing is clear in the high end. Yeah, I know that there are some older versions of. The, uh, the older versions of this mic that have the CK12 capsule, which is highly prized because it was in the C12. And a lot of people really like that microphone. That's an older version. Yeah. And then there there was a time then when AKG uh, went, put out a model of this microphone where the capsule was changed. Oh, okay. You know, and some people liked that and some people didn't. But that's the whole point of this microphone. There's a lot of versions out there. Yeah. And they're they're really good microphones. This thing here costs less than, than a Norman that's got all these switch positions on it, uh, and yet it sounds just wonderful. It's got so if you look at the front panel of this thing, it's got Omni, it's got cardioid, it's got kind of a wide cardioid, super cardioid, figure of eight. Yep. It's got if you flip it around to the back, it's got lots of roll offs in there. Yeah, three different roll off settings. That's unusual. Yeah, it's nice. This is a really nice microphone. I really like this thing. Yeah. Uh, and it, it literally, it has become, lately, it's become my favorite piano mic. And, you know, there's a lot of great piano mics out there, including some that are really small. Right. And that magnetically stick to the bars of the piano. Uh, those microphones also sound wonderful. But today we're talking about this one. But this is not the only mic that's great for piano. Uh, but anyway... Moving on, if you look at the, it's got the cardioid, hypercardioid, and figure of eight uh, frequency response graphs and polar patterns on yeah, here. Nice. So you can see, it's very good. You can see what's going on at the higher frequencies, how the polar pattern begins to kind of fall apart a little bit, which is typical of any microphone. Yep. It shows how the boost in the upper mid range or in the high end, if you want to call it that, changes as you as the polar patterns change, which is also not unusual for multiple polar pattern microphones. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a normal thing that you would see. It says the audio frequency bandwidth is twenty to twenty thousand hertz, but it doesn't say plus or minus what. Yeah. But it's okay. It's ameliorated by the fact there is a good word. It's it's <laughs> ameliorated by the fact that you have the graph. Yes, and and a graph for each polar pattern. Yeah, yeah. There aren't too many uh, aren't too many manufacturers that would go to that length to put in a polar you know, a frequency response graph for each polar pattern that the mic offered, and I think that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to close this this one for now and open up the other one, which is the C414 XLS. Right. And this microphone uh, is very similar, except the front. Instead of being gold, it's silver colored. The grill, yep. gr the grill on it is silver. If you look at the polar patterns, this microphone is flatter through the upper end and mid range right. than the one with the gold one. And that is, as I understand it, the basic difference between these two versions of microphones. So people might buy this one for spot micing orchestral instruments, for example, yeah, and use the other one that's got the boost in it in the high end for something that might be farther away because of air attenuation or maybe for a lead vocal. Yep. That's really the difference. So my, what I understand, that's the main difference between these two mics is that one is flatter in the top and the other one is not. Uh, so between these two mics, you know, one would say, oh, well, get the flat one and you can always add EQ. And I wouldn't disagree with that. You know, yeah. I think it's probably better to add EQ to a flat microphone than it is to try to take EQ out of a microphone that's got a boost in it, just in terms of being accurate in what you're doing. Yeah. This is another example of, of the fact that it gives a frequency response. And if it didn't also have the graphs, then I'd have a problem with it, but it does have the graphs. So that's great. And it talks about, you know, the, that the roll-off filters are, are at 160 and 80 and 40. Yep. That's three good selections. So when would you use those? Well, 40 would be great to get a rumble. Like, suppose you have a moving van company across the street from your home studio. <laughs> yes. You know, and those trucks park out there, and they rumble, and you can feel it in your feet, but you can't really hear it through your monitors. Well, guarantee you, your mic is getting that. Oh, absolutely. And maybe you can't hear it in your speakers, but you see your cones moving back and forth like crazy. Yeah. You know, that's... That's a bad thing, and that's what happens when you 
have monitors that don't go down as low as you know DC. So yeah, so forty hertz would be great for getting rid of rumble. Eighty hertz would be good for getting rid of proximity effect, and so would one sixty. And maybe 160 is a frequency you'd use for miking a flute where there's nothing down below that anyway. Yeah. Which reminds me that there are graphs you can see on the internet that show what the frequency responses are of different instruments. And that's a nice thing to sort of commit to memory. Uh, on that point, I have sitting on my uh, bench, I've actually got it, I've got it at work at the moment. I have uh, Bob Katz's book, um, Oh, what's it called? Mastering. That's a great book. Mastering yeah, audio. Yeah, I have that book. Yeah, I have that book. Yeah. So I, yeah, I yeah. picked that up uh, when you and I met at AES in Las Vegas in two thousand and eight, oh. and in that book is a fold out reproduction of a chart that lists all of the musical instruments from all of the, you know, the bass instruments down the bottom all the way up through all of the stringed instruments and the human voices in each, you know, tenor, alto, blah, 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 right up to all of your really high end, you know, high frequency type instruments like your piccolo flutes and your triangles and all that sort of stuff. And it shows the entire thing mapped out across a frequency range of 20 hertz to 20K and shows you where each instrument's range falls on that range, you know, which is a great reference tool. But it's a great thing to have. And just as another example, I mentioned flute earlier. Suppose you're recording solo violin. Mm-hmm. And you know there's nothing down at 100 hertz, yep. right? So you put a, a high-pass filter on there because, you know, all you're going to get is trouble. I've said that before. All you're going to get is trouble down there. What are you going to pick up if you don't roll off roll off the low end? You're going to get mic stand rumble. Yep. Uh, if the microphone is not hung by elasticity and you have, you know, somebody sets off an A-bomb in the desert, you know, 3,000 miles away, I mean, you know, Things get sensitive. And- hey, look, your violinist could be freestanding and only has to shuffle their feet. That's right. And that that can cause enough rumble to – it'll at least show up on a scope. Oh, yeah. And, and, and as you say, it's, it's just crud down in the bottom end of the frequency range that is doing nothing for the benefit of your mix. It's eating up headroom. You might as well roll it off. And and that's a whole big can of worms because I know there are fields of engineers who argue back and forth over whether or not you should roll off the bottom end of, you know, all all tracks, you know, up to the point at which the lowest frequency, you know, makes itself evident, you know, from the instrument itself. I personally, I'm in that camp. I do. I like to roll off everything that I know is of no benefit to me to clean up the bottom yeah. end because it makes the, you know, if you're mixing music, you know, it gives your kick drum and your bass guitar much more room to work when, you know, there's all this other low end crud that's been taken away that wasn't contributing to the music. And it can suck up a lot of headroom. Yeah, totally. So there's a book out uh, that I think is really good called Mixing Techniques for the Small Studio by Mike Senior, who's a writer for Sound on Sound magazine. Oh, nice. Which is a good magazine. I still, you know, there used to be a lot of good magazines back in the day. You know, there was Mix, there was Recording Engineer Producer, which was my favorite. Yep. Uh, And there were others. Uh, Sound on Sound has sort of taken on that mantle, if you will. Right. Uh, They do a a good job. And Mike Sr. is one of their writers. And this book has a lot of good ideas. And in that book, he discusses what we just talked about. And uh, he's obviously an advocate of doing it because he talks about doing it in the book. So that, for example, if you have all the cobwebs cleared out from your low end, then you can bring up what is other instruments have low end information, and there's less to interfere with them, and things can sound better and more clear. And anybody who's mixed pop music or even you know classic rock can tell you, getting your bass sound is one of the hardest things to do. Yeah. Getting your bass to sound great. I mean... God wishes, you know, I wish that it was as simple as, oh, this is a, uh, you know, a, an old 1962 Fender P bass and it's going through a tube preamp and straight into Pro Tools. There's no reason why it won't sound good, except it doesn't <laughs> sometimes, right? So sometimes you just have to play with stuff to make it sound good. Yeah. You know, it could be the strings, could be the player, could be that that bass was sat next to a magnet 15 years ago and nobody knows it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a- anything's possible. So 
it's really it's really one of the key things of a mix is getting your your bottom end right. Yeah. So if you have something down there that's interfering with that, I would just say, you know, in my own case, don't be a purist about it and say, oh, I've got to have a perfectly flat frequency response. That's fine if you're strictly an audiophile, but it's uh, I, I would say I would posit that it's not fine in the real world. No. So. To, to go back to uh, yeah, talking about books, and I've, I know I've mentioned this m- multiple times on this podcast in the past, uh, Mike Stavro, who now lives in Australia, wrote a book called Mixing With Your Mind, and you can buy the book at mixingwithyourmind.com. And one of the things that Stav talks about is this concept in, in air quotes of maximum illusion with minimum voltage. And what, you know, what Doc was talking about there with, you know, you're recording, say, a violin and you look on the scope and you can see all this activity down around, you know, 50 to 80 hertz. That's just all this low end rumble. That's adding voltage to the signal that's hitting the master bus. Yes. But it's contributing nothing to the music. And so, you know, Stab's assertion is, you know, roll all that off because it's not adding anything to the illusion, you know, it's just adding voltage that is doing nothing for you. And, and as we've said, you know, it's soaking up headroom. So, yeah. Well, I must, in, or, in all fairness, there is an, another point of view that says, especially in the analog world, that when you use equalizers, you're messing with the phase response of stuff. Yeah. And there are those who would say that sometimes that is a bigger problem than what you're getting rid of. So as always, just I, I would just say be aware of that. As always, the answer is what you hear. Yep. But I'm not afraid of rolling stuff off unless you know uh, if if it's not serving my function. You know, to me that's fine. But I recognize that there are others who. Well, I'll give you an example. I was at an AES show and there was these really high end mic preamps that somebody made that is a company, so I won't mention who they are. Mm. And these mic preamps do not have a high pass filter switch. Right. So I said to the designer owner of the company who was there in the booth, I go, you know, this is a deal breaker for me that I I wouldn't buy these because they don't have uh, a high pass filter. I mean, I'm not going to buy a preamp that doesn't have that. Why why did you choose to not do that? And he said, well, because I didn't want to do anything that would affect the sound. I'm looking for absolute purity of sound. And you can always use the roll off switch on your microphone. And internally, yeah. not not coming out of my mouth, but internally I was thinking, but what if I'm using microphones that don't have low frequency roll-offs, exactly. high pass filters? But, you know, I think his point of view is fine, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. But I don't use those preamps. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd be the same. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you can certainly do it in post. I mean- at the end of the day, if you if you're happy to do that, if you're working in the box, uh, and you can always throw a high pass filter plug in across you know the tracks, you can do that if you're happy to capture all that you know voltage unnecessarily and then take it off in post before you you know you as you're mixing the song. That's that's one approach, but. I think old school guys like you and I, Doc, we we would much prefer to you know get it right in camera, as we say on Shutter Zinc, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So um, I brought up another spec sheet. Yeah. Now, before we before we move on, there was one thing I just wanted to, to jump back to, and that was you, you you talked about phase as it relates to EQ roll off, and I, I will confess my my knowledge in that area of of how phase is affected by EQ roll off is limited, but if I understand it correctly. The issue gets worse the steeper the roll-off. Yes, and it's caused by reactance. It's caused, reactance is the word you want to use. Right. So reactance is resistance, but it's frequency dependent. So, for example, a capacitor uh, will, will be at a different place voltage-wise than a signal that just has a resistor there. And an inductor will be at the opposite point. So memory serves a capacitor, its voltage will be a, a head by 90 degrees of a resistor, and the inductor will be behind it. And this is really getting into the weeds, but... <laughs> I was going to say, you just lost me. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> you know, when you, when you have an analog equalizer and you turn down the treble, you're doing something in there that causes the treble to turn down. And sure. what you're doing is... Uh, aren't you, in a way, canceling out some of that treble, and aren't, and don't you use frequency uh, versus phase to cancel or boost things? Like I said, this is where my my knowledge sort of disappears. I know how to use an equalizer, but I could not tell you how it does it. <laughs> right. Well, you know, Harrison used to make a really great graphic equalizer right. that switched it switched at 5 megahertz, and what it did was if you moved a tone control down, it would mix that with the unrolled off tone control at 500 hertz and that and they blend together and the blend would change on how far you moved up or down that band and it sounded really great but i'm really going off the track all right so you were going to move on to a new spec sheet <laughs> yeah this is the neve 1073 rack mount preamp spec yeah now this is from the new neve company this is not from when rupert was there right but this is a Basically, their rendition of reproducing what Rupert designed when he was there back in the day. Right. And, uh, you know, the current Rupert Neve company makes excellent stuff. And the stuff that he used to design is very popular and, and very good. So when you say the current company, you're referring to Rupert Neve Designs? Yes, yeah. Rupert Neve Designs. Yeah. is they, they, make, they make different stuff than the old Neve company made. Yeah. And it's really, and it's really good. There's no question about that, but it's just different, that's all, because the Neve does kind of make his vintage versions. They've brought them back, you know? Right. And they're very popular, and they're very good. It must be frustrating for Rupert to always be competing against his greatest hits from the old <laughs> old days. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, he's a brilliant designer, and the stuff he makes now is great. So uh, it's just they're just different. They may as well not have the Neve name in that way. They're so different from each other, but... In this 1073, it talks about mic impedance being switchable from 300 ohms to 1200 ohms. And that's something relatively new, I think, in mic preamps where you can switch the input impedance. Yeah. I don't care about it that much, but some people do because if you change the frequency response of the mic, which is what happens when you change the impedance of the preamp, um, that's you know another thing that you have in your toolbox that you can do that. Sure. So um, I would probably just operate it in the 1200 ohm mode all the time if I owned it. But it talks about frequency response, and this is a good spec. It says frequency response at 60 dB gain. Welcome back to that. Into 600 ohm load, 20 hertz to 20K, plus or minus a half a dB. That's pretty good. Yeah. But it makes me wonder what happens when I don't have 60 dB of gain in there. Does it change much? And I would bet that it does, but it's probably still... It might not change enough to matter, you know, but, you know, op amps act differently when they have their gain settings changed. And so, again, getting back to somebody who's really a nit picker, mm. uh, you could pick that nit, but um, this looks like a good spec to me. And, you know, these things do sound good. There's just no question about it. I've uh, not had the pleasure of using one, but I would, uh, you yeah, know, would love to uh, to hear what they sound like. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's got good specs. It's got EIN, which stands for equivalent input noise. Right. Down at, down at minus 125, which is getting near the theoretical minimum there. Yeah. And THG plus noise. Again, THG stands for total harmonic distortion. Now, one way to lower distortion is, is massive amounts of negative feedback. Right. And we talked about that earlier. But if you're a good designer, you can get rid of, you can get your distortion numbers without doing that. Right. Okay. So it doesn't talk about negative feedback here directly, but it probably doesn't have much because I don't think Rupert was ever into a lot of negative feedback, but I don't want to speak for him. Yeah. So uh, input impedance 20K. Okay. That's pretty high. Yeah. Uh, I believe that is the, not the mic side, but the line side because the mic is, you know, yep. the mic is a three or 1200. So the 20K has to be the line side, which is pretty good when you think about the fact that most outputs it's going to see are probably down below 100 hertz. So you're definitely bridging the input. And it gives another frequency response for the line input side. It shows it plus or minus 1.25 dB all the way from 10 hertz to 20K. So that's, wow. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That's, right? that's linear. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I would just caution everybody that uh, 
First of all, I didn't bring, I didn't save any spec sheets for any equipment that I don't think is up to snuff. So right. just the fact that it's in my list means that I like it, yep. <laughs> or or expect or expect to like it if I haven't used it. But um, moving on, yeah. Uh, let's see. I found the spec sheet to the R eighty four AEA ribbon mic. Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. Looks. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what you're using right that's, now, right? That's exactly you, right. Well, you know, I know uh, the owner of this company. I know he does good work. Wes, uh, yep. Yeah, Wes is great. Yep. Um, he, he actually came out to Australia about, oh, eight or ten years ago. Oh, good. Came out to do a trade show. And I got to have a chat with him here while he was out here. Great, yeah. great. Well, his company's been in Pasadena since I started, you know. They've been there for a long time. Right. So they're 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 lo- located really good for us, not so much for you, but <laughs> yeah. for er- everybody here, they're good. Yeah. So this talks about their frequency range from twenty hertz to twenty kilohertz. Yep. But I don't see a spec as far as a, a graph showing their frequency response. No. And it doesn't. And it doesn't say plus or minus what. Yep. Now I know this is a good mic. There's no question about that, and it sounds wonderful. Yep. But I just wish it had that. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you don't, if you're just starting out, like, you know, when I was starting out, I would go to the AES show and walk out with bags of information from all the manufacturers, and I read all of it. Right. I I mean, I was a maniac, totally obsessed. And stuff like this would drive me crazy because I couldn't, I, I didn't know enough then to know that this thing would, I wouldn't have known that this is a great mic just from reading the specifications, but it is a great mic. There's yeah. no question about it. Yep. Uh, I think every, I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's a thing that Wes makes it isn't really great, but I just like to see more on the, on, on the, on the page. So it talks about SPL and output sensitivity and output impedance, which is 270 ohms nominal, meaning that it probably changes. Nominal means that it probably changes with frequency a little bit. Yep. Recommended load impedance, 1.2K or greater, so it, it would be happy with that mic pre from Neve. Yeah. Right? Powering, not required or recommended. So this microphone, you really don't want to plug this into an input that's got 48 volts of phantom power just sitting there. Yeah. Now, you might get lucky, and it might not blow up because there's a transformer output, but why put yourself through that? Uh, possibility and why ha- listen to the big pop that's going to come from it. <laughs> yeah. My understanding is as long as the 48 volts has been wired correctly, it won't cause an issue to the to the ribbon. But if by, you know, extreme bad luck, uh, something's been wired back to front, uh, so out of phase or out of polarity, uh, that will cause the ribbon to receive a massive input of voltage and that will snap the ribbon inside the mic well what if you what if one of the two okay so with phantom power you have a 6.8k resistor going from the 48 volts to pin two and a separate resistor going to pin three to power phantom power okay okay what happens if one of those resistors decides to die right. and doesn't send and, and doesn't send you a telegram <laughs> and then and, and you plug in the mic and it's only seeing phantom power on one side, and you hear the ribbon go. Yeah, I think great respect and great care has to be paid to ribbon microphones in terms of how they're handled. Yeah, even though modern ribbons are much more durable than the old RCA seventy sevens and forty fours and what have you, Sure makes a really nice ribbon. Obviously, Royer does, uh, and West does, and all and, of these microphones. And Road are in on the party now. Oh, Rhodes in on the party. Yeah, they have the NTR, which is an active ribbon. Well, I'm not surprised. And the fact that it's active means you need phantom power, right? That's correct. And that's great because that means that um, if you plug in something that's already hot, it'll expect it. And if you don't, then all you need to do is turn it on in order to get sound out of it. And, you know, I, I like Rode already. We know that from past podcasts. So I, I'd like to hear that, Mike. I might... I might buy one, <laughs> but I also I also like uh, I also like that the I think the Shure and the Ro- and the and the road mics are really good. I'm uh, not the road, but um, Royer, they're really good, and oh, I yeah, use the, those a the lot. The one twenty one, yes, the one twenty one and the one twenty two. Right. But getting back to specifications, 
It says polar pattern, native bidirectional pattern. Well, we know, and you've talked about it in the past, uh, how figure of eights work and the, the fact that the null point is really good. So here's one place you could use two ribbon mics. Mm -hmm. If you have a singer acoustic guitar player who wants to sing and play at the same time, you can aim, you can put a ribbon on the guitar and sort of aim it down at the guitar a little bit so the null point is at the singer's mouth. Yep. And then aim the one at the singer's mouth a little bit out so its null point is at the acoustic guitar. And you could get surprising isolation, yeah. even though this person is singing and playing at the same time. That can be really helpful, and ribbons are so good at that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, horizontal, vertical, blah, 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 transducer element, ribbon thickness, it gives that. I tend to get out of focus when I start reading some of this stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, but there are those who wouldn't. There are those who, who love that. And uh, I'm too tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's a good microphone. And you're here, folks, you're hearing it now. You're hearing it on Bruce. Yeah, it's all good. Absolutely. Mate, should we wrap this up? Sure. The last thing, I'd I, I just like to talk about something that really quick before we wrap it up. Sure. I've got the SM57 and the SM58 specifications here as well. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, the SM58 is that ubiquitous sure microphone that's got the ball at the end of it, which is a, a plosive filter and, and all that. And the 57 is pretty much the same microphone without that filter on it. Yeah. I've had good luck in a pinch taking an SM58 and un unscrewing and removing that ball at the end. Oh, okay. And getting what sounds like an SM57 response out of that microphone in that case. Interesting question. Does the ball pop filter on the 58 really uh, affect the sound of the mic a whole lot? I've never done an A-B comparison between the two. I think it does affect it a little tiny bit. Okay. Yes. All right. I've always looked at a 58 as being a 57 with a pop shield in it. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've always treated it that way. And if I unscrew that pop filter, I then think of the mic as a 57 and I haven't been let down yet. Yeah, right. If you now, if you look at the frequent response of the 57, which I'm looking at right now, it looks like a more extreme version of that early um, Sennheiser mic that we looked at, the 421. It's got a roll off in the bottom yep. that starts above 100 hertz. Yep. Right? So it's it's really cranking down there, and it's got this big boost in the mid-range, and then at the high frequency, it rolls off fast. Well, that explains why this is good for vocals on stage. Yeah. It helps with feedback because you, there's, it's rolling off stuff that might feed back. Uh, that high frequency boost is great for helping the vocal cut through. And there have been times in the studio when I've gotten better results out of a mic like this than I have out of an expensive mic because at the end of the day, different people need different things. So this microphone says 40 hertz to 15K. Yep. But it has a graph, and it's got the polar pattern graphs versus frequency that show you what's happened in the high frequencies. So there's nothing missing from this spec sheet that I can see, which is not surprising coming from a company as great as Sure. I mean, they, you know, I, I, I said this to my students. They make just good stuff. Yeah. Now, what they make might not be good for your particular application sometime, but that doesn't mean that it's not quality, right? Yeah. Uh, this is a company that's reliable. If you buy an SM57 one day and you buy another one two years later, it's going to be the same mic. <laughs> yeah. And that just goes a long way, yeah. in my opinion. You know, What so. I do find interesting, just comparing the two frequency response graphs between the 57 and the 58, is how much earlier the low end starts to roll off on the 57. Like, it actually goes into yeah, sort of negative territory from around about 200 hertz down. Right. Where, where with the 58, it's pretty much flat right down to 100 and then rolls off, but at a much steeper angle. Well, I'm wondering if part of that has to do with less proximity effect close to the mic because you can't get as close to the capsule. Uh, could be. Could be. That's, a, that, that's something to ask the people... Uh, at sure, yeah, you know, it's got a f very similar but different high end boost on it, so it looks very similar, yeah, but not exact, yep. Uh, you know, and I've used both of these mics forever, they also double as a hammer, yeah, <laughs> exactly, <you know? laughs> they're indestructible, yeah. 
So uh, that's a really good point that you bring up, and I'd be interested in hearing what Shure has to say about it. Uh, but these are both really good mics, and definitely uh, every studio owner should have at least one, Yeah, I would think. Yeah, definitely. Although it would not be my first choice for violin. It's a good mic. No. <laughs> Although, you know, 57s, I can't tell you how many times I've put 57s on on snare drums. Yeah, well, I mean, it's almost the the de facto standard for snare, isn't it? Certainly for pop and rock. Well, sure. But also, you know, Telefunken makes a set of drum mics that are all dynamic mics that also sound really good right. on snare, the, the one. And uh, sometimes something like a KM84 can sound good on snare, depending on the style of music. So there's a lot of variation there. But I would say the 57 is pretty ubiquitous. Yeah, definitely. That was four syllables. I don't know. I don't... <laughs> Four syllables. That's beyond. I know. I don't have the RAM inside my head to even think about <laughs> four syllables. Should we have a quick look at the TLM 103 before we wrap this? Sure. Why not? Let me open it up. Now, there's a very popular TV show yeah. that I won't say the name of that um, we used TLM 103s on because the producers of the show wanted it. Right. Now, this was a case where ADR did not use the same microphone that was used on the set, and I think we talked about that in an earlier podcast. I think we did. Yeah, we did talk about that. But this is a really good way to have a Neumann microphone without spending what it takes to buy a U87 because this mic doesn't have a second capsule, so it won't do anything but cardioid, and it doesn't have a roll-off switch or a pad. But, you know, if all you need is cardioid and you want that good Neumann quality, you can get it from this mic. Yeah. But it has a similar price to the newer 414s that we were looking at. And the 414s give you more flexibility in all of their different selections. And, and, and they're both yeah, good mics. Yeah, five polar patterns into, into the bargain. Right. But, you know, let's face it. If, for those of you who are building a home studio, you're going to have clients who just expect to see a Neumann mic when they get ready to do their vocals. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And this is a good mic. This is this mic does have a little, let's look at the, here's the polar pattern and frequency response graphs. Let me open that up. Uh, let's see. It talks about, oh, it's a pressure gradient, which we've talked about before. Uh, 20 hertz to 20K, but it does give a graph, so that's okay. Impedance, output impedance, obviously not input impedance, is 50 ohms. Uh, wants to see at least a, a K. You know, I'm looking at the frequency response graph. Yes. That is conspicuous in its flatness. Is it really me, that flat? Well, it does have it does have that boost above five K. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I realize that. But but in between say three K and down to say seventy hertz, it's yeah. like ruler flat. I've never seen a microphone that was that flat in its response. I'd be interested to know if that is has genuinely been measured to be that flat, or if they've just kind of averaged out the curve. <laughs> well, that's a that's a fair question, and you'd have to call the George Norman Company <laughs> yeah. uh, to ask it. Yeah. All I know is is that the microphone sounds great on drum overheads and lead vocals. Yeah. And uh, cellos, actually. Right. I think that's a good question, and I, and I don't know the answer to it. I would say that. Big companies have a lot to lose when they start paying fast and loose with their specifications. Oh, you know? yes. So it's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine that Norman, you know, would do any funny stuff. But nevertheless, it is a valid question. Yeah. It does. It does look ruler flat there between about eighty or seventy and uh, up to three k around four k. Yeah, yeah, up to three k uh, ruler flat. Yeah. Notice that it has a roll off in the bottom end below fifty, no matter what you do. Yeah. But that's okay because there's nothing down there. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and this is heresy, but there have been times when I have actually used high pass filters on a bass guitar track because I had issues where the bass was too rumbly. Right. Even if you've rolled off everything to leave room for the bass, the bass could possibly, especially if it's a full frequency bass, uh, like some of the more modern ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you might actually have to play with that too down at the low end. It's, you know, there's, there's, gee, I wish there were easy rules to being an engineer. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you actually have to listen and make a decision based on what you're hearing. So hopefully you don't have speakers in a room that are lying to you, which is a whole other podcast. Yeah. You know, you could do worse than at least ask 
the guitarist in question you know what's the lowest note on that bass that you are actually going to play during this song you know because if you know what the lowest note is you can soon look up a frequency chart and find out what frequency that note is is meant to resonate at yes you know and, and it might be you know it might be at 38 hertz and you can go okay well i can chuck in a you know 12 db per octave slope at 35 hertz and know that i'm not doing any damage to the actual musicality of the instrument but i'm getting rid of it the super low end that's really not going to add any illusion and is simply adding voltage. Well, if he's going to play at 38 hertz, right away you know he's got a five or a six string bass. Exactly. All right, because a four string bass won't go that low unless you detune it down. Yeah. But that's why I say, you know, always you could ask the guitarist, you know, ask the bass player. Say, you know what I, you know what I do a lot is I, you know, if I want to roll something off down there, I put the filter on and I move it around until I like what I hear. It's a lot, it's, it's fast. Yeah. So for example, you know, if I've got a guitar and I know in my mind that his lowest notes tuned to standard tuning is going to be about 82 hertz. Yep. Still, you know, I've rolled off acoustic guitar as high as 160 yep. in order to keep it out of the way of the bass or because he's playing maybe... You know, who knows? Maybe he's playing Nashville tuning where everything's up an octave. And, and right. uh, you guys can Google Nashville tuning if you want to know what that means. Uh, or maybe he's capoed up the neck or something like that. So I will just put a filter on there and I will raise it up until it starts taking stuff off that I like. Yeah. And then I'll back it off and I'll back it off so I'm not doing any damage. And then I'll usually look later to see what frequency I ended up using it by. Yeah. So. That's not because I think your idea is a bad idea. It's simply because I am lazy. But look, at the end of the day, and I've I've said this when it comes to uh, mixing and, you know, in regards to people, you know, mixing for podcasts and being overly concerned about how the levels are reading on a, on a peak program meter. Don't worry about that stuff. Use your ears to set volumes between different people speaking on your podcast, you know, because at the end of the day, and this sort of relates to what we're discussing now about frequency, at the end of the day, the person listening to the song isn't looking at a scope. You know, that it doesn't matter what frequencies you've cut out or left in. At the end of the day, all that matters is what you hear because the listener who is, you know, hopefully enjoying this song is only concerned by the emotion of the song and, and what it says to them. They, you know, they're not, they're not sitting there looking at a scope while they're listening to the song, you know? <laughs> so, right. So I think, you know, using your ears is the perfectly valid approach. Well, like I said before, nobody's going to say, Oh, I don't like the sound of that vocal because I can tell it's a plug-in. Well, nobody can tell it's a plug-in. No. And it's really great to be able to open a session a couple of years later and everything comes back exactly the way it was. So yeah. when somebody says they want a minor change, it isn't like the end of the world. Like I just, I mixed a song for a rock band very recently uh, and I sent, I sent them a, a file and they, and they called me back and said they'd like a little tweak in one guitar being louder and one guitar being softer. Well, no problem. Yeah. It was easy. Yep. Cause the only hardware I used is this old Neve, uh, stereo bus compressor. Let me just move out of my way. I'll give you the model number here. Sure. It's a 33609 slash J. Okay. And I know that UA with their plugins, they model this one. Well, I've got, well, I've got the hardware and I tend to use this on my uh, mix bus sometimes. And, uh, Sounds great. But other than that, and I've and and it's all step switches, so it's really easy to put this back to whatever setting I had it on. Yep. It's not like, you know, so it would be suitable for mastering just for that reason, right? Yep. All intrinsic as that is in order to be suitable for mastering, it's gotta be properly balanced in terms of level and frequency response between both sides of it. That's kind of a, you know, duh. Yep. Kind of need to know that. But, <laughs> but this is why mastering engineers tend to use stepped pots on stuff. Yeah. And I can't think of anybody who gets pickier than a good mastering engineer, and God bless them for it. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Doc, we've been going for about an hour and a half. We should probably wrap this up. And this was going to be a short podcast. What happened? <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. Maybe you had to get out your scissors and your 3M block and cut <laughs> some off. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Mate, great to chat. Great to chat. All right, man. We'll uh, talk soon. Absolutely. You take care, and we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, bye. Sign language.
Another audio to you.com quality podcast. For questions, comments, and feedback, email the boys at signlanguagepodcast.com.